Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at UVA and to be participating in this timely and intellectually stimulating conversation about reparations. Uh, given our delayed start, I will keep my comments brief. In 1961, in a speech titled Equality Now, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. powerfully argued that the U.S. government should give African Americans reparations. King called for an expansive program that included employment guarantees and, for our purposes on this panel today, new opportunities in higher education. He stated, and I quote, a recent visit to India revealed to me the vast opportunities opened to a government determined to end discrimination. When it confronted the problem of centuries-old discrimination against the untouchables, India began its thinking at a point that we have not yet reached. Probing its moral responsibilities, it concluded that the country must atone for the immense injustices imposed upon the untouchables. It therefore made provision not only for equality, but for special treatment to enable the victims of discrimination to leap the gap from backwardness to competence. Thus, millions of rupees are set aside each year to provide scholarships, financial grants, and special employment opportunities for the untouchables. To the argument that this is a new form of discrimination inflicted upon the majority population, the Indian people respond by saying, that this is their way of at atoning for the injustices and indignities heaped upon uh, their 70 million untouchable brothers. Although discrimination has not yet been eliminated in India, the atmosphere there differs sharply from that in our country. In India, it is a crime punishable by imprisonment to practice discrimination against an untouchable. And even without this coercion, so successfully has this government made the issue a matter of moral and ethical responsibility that no government figure or political leader on any level would dare to defend discriminatory practices. One could wish that here in the United States we had reached this level of morality." End quote. While India clearly still struggles with caste discrimination more than 60 years after the system was formally abolished by law, and while we obviously may be critical of the concept of backwardness, King's argument for reparations, made two years before his march on Washington, still resonates today. King looked across the world to a nation that many Americans paternalistically considered less developed and in turn challenged America to develop the moral and ethical courage of the Indian government by providing admissions, scholarships, and vocational training opportunities for previously disenfranchised populations. These are among the topics engaged in the papers we will hear from Al Brophy, Tim Lovelace, and Verna Williams in that order. I will let each panelist know when they have about five minutes left, and we will look forward to Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm honored to be here on a panel with folks whose work I've been reading for uh, a number of years now. Um, and honored to be at this conference where we are revisiting it, the um, multiple directions that reparations has gone in since I last seriously worked on this as a topic in 2006. And I feel sort of like Rip Van Winkle awakened, <laughs> coming back to this village of reparations discussion and sort of shocked at how many changes there, how much we're seeing um, episodes of reparations claims made in American history, but also the claims um, made um, uh, being made now. Um, and it's a sort of, it's a uh, heartwarming to see so much positive action, um, even though um, positive, po positive um, uh, advocacy, even though um, the episodes of, of, of realization of reparations have not been as much as we would get at one. Reparations is an idea in the minds of former slaves and abolitionists, sometimes whispered as they put forth a new vision of law and equality. David Walker's uh, appeal to the colored citizens of the world, you may recall, had the temerity to suggest that money might be owed to enslaved people as wages for their work. Uh, and Walker's book drew excitement and fear uh, from slaveholders. So many southern legislatures increased punishments to stop the circulation of such abolitionist literature. And he was, in fact, blamed in the wake of Nat Turner's August 1831 rebellion here in Virginia for having set that in motion. 
um, and it, that was cited is uh, along with other anti-slavery literature that made appeals to things like the Declaration of Independence um, uh, as evidence that uh, both Virginia and North Carolina needed to restrict the access of enslaved people to both religion and literacy. Pro-slavery writers, of course, uh, ridiculed the idea of uh, reparations or even freedom and spent time writing about how emancipation would be an economic catastrophe, but the day of reckoning was drawing near. Walker's appeal may or may not have been what set Turner's rebellion in motion. Uh, perhaps it was something, as some pro-slavery writers wrote in the wake of the rebellion, um, a question of uh, appeal to um, human ideas of emancipation and freedom, rather than uh, maybe those ideas were not set loose by uh, print. But what's interesting um, about the aftermath of that rebellion was not just that it took place, but the extraordinary violence used to put it down. The technology of law and the gun were used to extract punishment against countless people, many of whom clearly were innocent. Um, and but to, and uh, among the many gruesome facts of, of that uh, of the rebellion and its aftermath is that enslaved um, people who'd been executed had their heads put on poles as warning to others. Mm -hmm. To this day, um, there is a Blackhead signpost road in um, uh, Southampton, Virginia, where the rebellion took place. The great irony, I suppose, is that at the end of that road is a largely segregated um, elementary and middle school ground. What the rebellion also put in motion, though, was um, the extensive discussion, largely by academics, uh, about the institution of slavery. So when the Virginia legislature in the spring of 1832 began to debate, well, what should be done about slavery? And some people, mostly from Western Virginia, what is now West Virginia, uh, in the legislature, um, uh, and, and, and people from the Shenandoah Valley, including Representative um, James McDowell, um, argued for a gradual emancipation plan. Other people uh, took up the defense of slavery. And so you had um, Thomas Dew, who was a history professor at William & Mary and subsequently president at William & Mary, wrote one of the um, most important pro-slavery treatises in the pre-Civil War South called the Review of the Debates in the Virginia Legislature. An interesting moment here, um, uh, you may recall that David Walker's uh, appeal said the most wretched person on the face of the earth was a, um, uh, or, was a or enslaved people in uh, the, the United States. Do takes that, right, responds to that and flips it and says the most, um, uh, the luckiest people on the face of the United States are the slaves of the United States. He had a eco, and so there's a dialogue that's already taking place here between <coughs> enslaved people and formerly enslaved people and pro-slavery thinkers, including pro-slavery thinkers in the academy. Uh, at my own campus on the University of North Carolina, uh, the following spring, um, Justice Gaston delivered a mildly anti-slavery speech that was inspired by the rebellion. Um, Gaston had spent time writing um, documents for his Quaker clients before he went on the bench that would free um, the, uh, to uh, help emancipate enslaved people. Um, and, but, uh, and so when he gives an, the graduation address uh, less than a year after the rebellion, he says, you know, what we need to do is take some kind of action against slavery. That wasn't much, but it was more than many people in the South uh, were willing to say, white people and stuff anyway, members of the slaveholding class were willing to say against slavery. Everything I say is so important, must be recorded for posterity, of course. Um, the, um, and so we had a, 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 there's an important story here about the way in which 
universities um, are generators and disseminators of pro-slavery thought, how they train the next generation of um, pro-slavery um, thinkers. But there's also a story here to tell about uh, how universities are places of, um, uh, that actually own human beings. Let me use one vignette here from across the Shenandoah Valley at um, uh, uh, Washington College, what's now Washington and Lee, which in 1825 received a gift of about 73 human beings from uh, a, um, a, a donor, um, uh, Robinson. Uh, this is his will. His will provided that, that none of the enslaved people were to be sold for 50 years. And maybe he was thinking at this point that 50 years down the road from 1825, slavery would have ended, and for, of course he was correct, would have been correct in that. Uh, and so that led the university, Washington College then, to try and decide, well, what was it going to do with all the enslaved people it owned? It rented a number of them out, and here's a handbill um, announcing that the college was renting uh, a number of people, and this was um, in December of 1826, and as you may recall, uh, January 1st is the typical starting date for um, uh, rentals of human beings for a year. Uh, that idea didn't last very long. Uh, shortly after, after this, they found that um, they thought they could, uh, uh, would rather sell their entire um, uh, uh, human, all the human beings they owned, which they did after they obtained a letter from a lawyer giving them an opinion letter saying it's fine to go ahead and uh, disregard the restraint on sale. Um, <laughs> And they used that, the, the enslaved people then were sold to a, a, um, a plantation in Mississippi. Um, and uh, the money was used to build Robinson Hall, which to this day stands on the campus of Washington College. And here's the, Washington and Lee, and here's a, um, uh, the monument to um, William Robinson um, for his contributions to the university. Uh, since I am at uh, uh, the University of Virginia, perhaps it, it's uh, worth it to spend a few minutes talking about um, uh, uh, ideas um, about uh, pro that were disseminated on this campus about pro-slavery thought. Uh, James Holcomb, who was a law professor here um, in the 1850s, uh, was um, one of the strongest advocates in favor of slavery in the 1850s. He um, had a number of sort of creative ideas. One of the things was he argued in an address to alumni that they should give more money to the university so that the university could hire more faculty to um, uh, write and teach about pro-slavery ideas. Um, it, it, later on, he developed an argument um, that sort of flips Jefferson's statement that all people are created equal on its head um, and argues that, in fact, natural law does not um, is not against slavery, it supports slavery, which is an argument that then becomes very important to um, the sort of nationalization of uh, slavery. If we think there is, that slavery is supported wherever enslaved people go, that, makes, that tends to make slavery national rather than confined. Uh, the person who, in the academy, who probably did the most, though, to promote the institution of slavery was Thomas Cobb, who was a co-founder of what's now the University of Georgia Law School. He wrote, he published in 1858 um, a 600-page pro-slavery treatise that combined both history with contemporary law. Um, and uh, he is, in some ways, I think, an answer to a question that Martha um, uh, Biondi had, had posed yesterday, um, which is, how often do intellectuals um, or academics promote visions of history that then become actually powerful um, outside of the academy? He was a person who um, drew upon a number of um, pseudoscientific um, and also pseudo-historical studies to suggest slavery was ubiquitous in human history, and therefore what we should do is um, uh, promote slavery. Uh, and that is sort of, it, it was argued in favor of 
um, of, of, of pro-slavery uh, contemporary law because of the economic necessity of slavery and because of its ubiquity in history. Um, he drew, for example, upon several um, uh, uh, treatises on um, Egyptian um, uh, history. There are probably people in here in this room who know much more about this history than I do, and I don't know whether this is an accurate history, but he draws and an references tomb inscriptions that pr purport to show um, enslaved Africans even in Egypt. Cobb is a, a person, an engaged activist scholar, because he is somebody who went after the um, uh, uh, secession, after Lincoln's election, went to the Georgia legislature and was a key figure in the uh, uh, secession debates. And then, not having, not being satisfied with having propelled his uh, state, uh, which was critical in in the entire secession movement, into secession, he then entered the military and uh, rose to the rank of general where he died on the battlefield fighting for the cause he believed in at Fredericksburg. And this is the monument put up by the non-daughters of the Confederacy uh, to him. Um, and this is uh, Justice Thomas Ruffin in the hall named after him on the UNC campus. There are a great many things um, that one could talk about um, in this reparations um, debate. Um, one of the things that interests me greatly is how much in recent years um, the movement for reparations has declined. Here I chart um, the debate over reparation uh, or references to reparations and slavery in law review articles. You see they peak around 2004 and then have declined precipitously. Um, uh, and uh, as uh, Michael Dawson suggested yesterday, there's um, we have an awfully long way to go uh, before we can obtain uh, political, act, uh, political support for this. Is one example that uh, comes from the Mobile Register um, back in 2002. Um, uh, when the Mobile Register polled on, on uh, reparations for slavery, they found it was the most racially divisive issue they'd ever dealt with. And they said something like two thirds of African Americans were in favor and something like 5% of whites were in favor, um, but they had to say something like because some white people became so enraged at the mere suggestion of reparations that they couldn't complete the poll. Now, why that, that isn't, uh, you can't just put them down as no and move on. I'm not sure Michael, you or Melissa, another expert on, on polling, can, can, can tell me a great deal about this. Um, you know, so reparations relies on the sorts of many episodes of extraordinary violence, the brutality of slavery, episodes of riots like the Tulsa riot. Um, uh, uh, but there are other, um, and some people when they you know ask about well reparations for slavery say well when are white people going to get reparations for the plantations that were destroyed and these slaves who were free during the. Civil War. Now, of course, you'll recall that some loyal slave owners did receive compensation um, during the Civil War. Um, that was provided by Congress um, in, during the emancipation in the West Indies. Um, uh, slave owners there received compensation from the British Parliament. Um, and here is an image from Clark Hall in, at the University of Alabama, which is named after the man who... Um, uh, managed the 46,000 acres of public lands Congress gave to the institution in reparation for the 1865 destruction of the campus by federal troops. Right, so there's been reparations, just not in the um, for slavery, just not in the way which we usually think of it. Um, I, I, I in, I'm just going to use I'm going to condense a, a bunch of things down to two last stories. Um, there's another uh, lawsuits I think are are unlikely to be um, terribly successful. Um, but there are occasionally lawsuits that I think point out the way in which people whose claims matured a long time ago may still be given some um, credence by courts. And here I give you Confederate Memorial Hall, which is a um, dormitory on the Vanderbilt campus. And Vanderbilt, about a decade ago, went to take away the name Confederate from the from the hall. But the United Daughters of the Confederacy were the people who'd given some of the money for the construction of the hall, not all of it, 
back in the 1930s sued and were able to successfully um, prevent the university from renaming the hall. This suggests that you know claims that um, were matured decades ago are still sometimes given effect. I do think that there's one um, kind of lawsuit that um, uh, that um, may have some kind of uh, other that may be successful, and that is lawsuits for um, uh, descendants of enslaved people to visit the the graves that are on private property of their ancestors. This arose uh, in one concrete case recently when descendants of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson asked for access to the Jefferson um, uh, Cemetery at Monticello and uh, were denied access to that. Um, I think this is one place where those descendants, if they were inclined, could have a successful lawsuit. One, and let me conclude with, I had some other examples, but let me conclude with um, this one picture. Um, it, it's, as universities go back and try and revisit um, their past, uh, I think we need to be careful about episodes not of recalling the past, but of trying to forget it. I think on this campus, when the Board of Visitors rather abruptly apologized for the, their connections to the institution of slavery, that had the effect of stopping discussion, right? After, well, you've had your apology, what more do you want? Game over, done. Um, and this I give you from uh, uh, Brown University, where, uh, excuse me, Yale University. This is Elihu Yale, who was the um, namesake of, of um, uh, Yale University. This picture of a presumably enslaved child um, waiting on Elihu Yale, and we think he's an enslaved child because he has a collar, he has a metal collar on, um, hung until very recently in the room where the Board of Trustees at Yale met. But they took this down. And the reason they took it down was not um, because it was a reminder of the subordination and brutalization that was central to slavery. They took it down because there's no evidence that Elihu Yale ever owned an enslaved person, and they thought it misrepresented um, his culpability in the institution. So the era of forgetting is, is well upon us. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll start my comments today um, with a quote uh, by Robert Pickett. He was the national president of the then Black American Law Student Association um, in 1971 and 1972. The 1970s will be a crucial decade in nurturing a cadre of black liberators within the legal system. In a society valuing those legal traditions, reinforcing the white majority's tyranny, black lawyers, despite massive barriers, have been a cutting edge slashing at racism's jugular. Without a doubt, they have played a crucial role in lifting from their people's shoulders the burdens imposed by a racist society. Because of racism, blacks have learned to regard the law with mistrust and skepticism. Was it not this society which clung so long and so fast to the despotic ideal of separate but equal? Was it not this society which rationalized its most repressive practices in the name of law? Is it not this society which even now calls for law and order to stifle the voices of protest rising from the ranks of the oppressed? But despite these manifest reasons for distrusting the legal system, blacks can ill afford the luxury of dismissing the law as irrelevant. Problems do exist. They must be recognized and solved. Despite our limited numbers, our nascent organization, our limited financial resources, and the odds, black lawyers will solve them. We gladly assume David's mantle against this callous Goliath. As Martha Biondi's work has skillfully highlighted, black lawyers, at first blush, appear to be an unlikely group to embrace black power. During the late 1960s, many black activists offered stinging criticisms of black lawyers. They were too wedded to legal liberalism. They were gradualists, using test cases and working within the system. 
The NAACP in particular had received the brunt of this criticism. Although the NAACP Legal Defense Fund had provided much needed bail money and representation for activists on the ground during the 1960s, black power activists later in the decade decried the organization's court-centered vision of social change, its initial reluctance to adopt civil disobedience, and a conception of public education that seemed to validate the argument that black students only, only learned when sitting next to white school children. Furthermore, black power activists often underscored that the law in the United States had functioned as, quote, the handmaiden of the property class, as a tool of coercion used to silence political dissonance and create conformity to an oppressive rule of law. Within the legal academy, black power and its actors remain understudied. In fact, most of the work on black power on college campuses has focused on undergraduate education. In the law reviews and books, you are, mo you are more likely to see historical accounts of the development of critical legal studies or critical race theory. And law students are far more likely to know about the NAACP's legal, stru legal struggle for equality in graduate and professional education than black power. But it's during the black power movement that you see any sizable populations of black students in most US law schools. Here at the University of Virginia, you see this phenomenon. Following a lawsuit by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the University of Virginia School of Law admitted Gregory Swanson in 1950. After Swanson left the university's law school in 1951, quote, due to what he described as an overwhelmingly, overwhelming climate of racial hostility and harassment, it would be four more years before another African-American law student attended the University of Virginia. It's not until the late 1960s that you see any sizable populations of black law students at UVA Law. Thus, while we celebrate, while we often celebrate the accomplishments of the civil rights movement in desegregating the legal academy, it's actually the black power movement that brings the legal academy to anything more than token uh, desegregation. So today I want to do three things. First, I want to revisit the black power movement and examine its impact on the legal academy. Second, I will explore how the debates on reparations gave new texture, new energy, and a new level of cultural confidence for law students interested in racial insurgency. Finally, I will conclude by reconsidering the legacy of the reparations debate in light of contemporary civil rights jurisprudence. So first, as we think about black power in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the most significant development is the establishment of the Black American Law, Black American Law Students Association, BALSA. It's founded in 1968 by A.J. Cooper, an NYU law student. And pursuant to the logic of many black power activists, BALSA initially did not place itself or its founding within the traditions of Thurgood Marshall or even Charles Hamilton Houston. But its founders, but its founders placed the organization's origins within the tradition of non-lawyers committed to both legal and social change. Robert Pickett asserted, Balsa was a logical outgrowth of the troubled 1960s, the period when such advocates of social and moral uh, regeneration as Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael et al. spoke with fiery eloquence for black people to assert themselves in the arena of self-determination and blackness. This eloquence was the articulation of the black community's collective disgust and despair in this country. Detroit, Newark, Harlem, and Watts stand as living testimonials to that despair. Over the next three years, BALSA grows from an organization with three chapters to over 100 chapters. Its structure is deeply democratic. There are local chapters, there's a regional organization, and then there's also a national level. We also see during this period the establishment of the Black Law Journal, a periodical for black dissidents who could not be published in traditional law reviews. Also, we see the foundation of the National Conference of Black Lawyers, the NCBL. In May of 1969, more than 200 black law students gathered in Chicago to launch a new organization. Its first full-time national director, Haywood Burns, 
assumed his duties under the national co-chairmanship of Robert Carter, formerly of the NAACP, and Floyd McKissick. There was an intergenerational dialogue with experienced practitioners and law students. They posed as an alternative to the more conservative National Bar Association. On their campuses, black law students were protesting the gross underrepresentation of black law students. At Harvard, NYU, Emory, black law students protest to establish special admissions programs. Across the country, black law students call for black-only scholarships and greater financial aid. They demand that their law schools hire black professors and implement changes in curriculum. A class on civil rights, if offered at all, was not enough. They demanded new seminars at schools like Yale. And for example, they, they received these new seminars in the form of classes called the role of the black lawyer. In the late 1960s and early 1970s in the legal academy, there was also a renewed commitment to, to clinical education. African-American students and their radical white counterparts called for new courses in poverty law and landlord and tenant issues. But the most spirited debates were the debates between black law students themselves. Black lawyers by 1970 only comprised about 3% of all lawyers. One report showed that there were only 506 black lawyers in 11 southern states in 1968. And in the pages of Balsa bulletins, law review articles, and even on the pages of Jet and Ebony magazine, we see this tension between blacks in the legal academy about how black law students and black law graduates should use their law degrees. Professor Harry Edwards of Michigan Law School argued that blacks should not segregate themselves within the practice of law, that we needed more black lawyers to go into corporate practice rather than do social justice work or government work. And there were some, particularly those who embraced black capitalism, who applauded Ed Edwards for his stance. But given the maldistribution of legal resources along race, class, and geographic lines, others dissented. One more polite uh, dissent appeared in the North Carolina Central Law Review in 1973. The writer wrote, this writer is not opposed to placing black lawyers in corporate superstructures as long as it isn't assumed that by placing a few elitists in, quote, responsible positions, anything will change for black folks in this country. The black lawyer who sits in the executive suite on the board of directors for some super corporation may well feel that he has accomplished something for, quote, his people. But the truth is that black folks really don't need any more, quote, leaders who bend elbows with the, quote, best at cocktail parties. Black folks need practitioners who can do the unglamorous trench duty in the criminal courts, the landlord tenant courts, and the other, quote, scut chores that, quote, respectable lawyers too often eschew. Reparations adds new texture to these debates about black power. Obviously, reparations was an old idea, but you begin to see the first articles and law reviews on reparations appear during this period. You also see a book um, that had been sparked by James Foreman's um, Black Manifesto. This book was called uh, The Case for Reparations. It's by a uh, Yale law professor, Boris Bicker. Black students argued that they are owed something, that admission should not simply admit them because they are doing the right thing, but that they owe their people something. Financial aid should also be guaranteed. Black students um, and the Black Economic Development Conference, which sponsored the Black Manifesto, called for black law students to take new classes and urge uh, black students to press their law professors and deans to adopt new classes. In property and land use law, black law students are interested in taking these courses because land is a commodity quickly disappearing for black people in the South. Black law students were urged to demand and take more classes in criminal justice, that the U.S. government would imprison many black activists in the revolutionary fight for reparations. And we had seen this even before the reparations debate, they argued. We had seen this with Huey Newton and with Angela Davis. The Republic of New Africa convened with both black law students and black lawyers arguing that law students needed to be trained to develop innovative legal theories to help establish through courts and through world forms a new category of rights and protections for blacks. But not only um, were lawyers needed to be visionaries, but the movement needed black technocrats, lawyers 
who, if we received reparations, could be um, trusted to manage the Black Land Bank. In other words, the reparations movement challenged black law students to prepare themselves for forthcoming social changes, that they might position themselves in terms of their skills to help manage the world coming. In conclusion, our contemporary debates on reparations and the role of reparations in the legal academy has become circumscribed at best. There are few courageous scholars, like my fellow panelists who publish books and law review articles on reparations, teach about reparative justice in their courses, and even participate in contemporary reparations litigation and lobbying efforts. But most frequently, and I think at times, unfortunately, reparations is limited to discussions of affirmative action in admissions. To be sure, affirmative action in admissions today is not reparations. Law school admissions is about anything but reparative justice, and we can understand this through several lenses. In the, in the 1978 Supreme Court opinion, Regents of California v. Bakke, Justice Lewis Powell declared that countering the effects of societal discrimination was not a compelling governmental justification for affirmative action. Citing Boris Bicker's 1973 book, The Case for Black Reparations, Powell wrote that, quote, the view of the compensation goal is that it serves as a form of reparation by the majority to a victimized group as a whole. He continued that, quote, the remedying of past effects of societal discrimination is an amorphous concept of injury that may be ageless in its reach into the past. We have never approved a classification that aids persons perceived as members of relatively victimized groups at the expense of other in innocent individuals in the absence of judicial, legislative, or administrative findings of constitutional or statutory violations, end quote. Reparations replacement is the ultimate interest convergence, a diversity rationale that black and brown students matter in so much that they benefit corporate America, the military, and the educational experiences of their white counterparts. Moreover, given the near arms race to remain competitive in US news rankings, law school admissions processes are driven by LSAT scores and undergraduate GPAs, statistical measures that continually have a disparate impact on admitting even a quote, diverse law school class. One of the results of not admitting students who think about reparative justice, training students who are thinking about reparative justice, and more importantly, not organizing around reparations in the legal academy, is that we've received racial justice on the cheap. We are, not, we are in a, particularly qua, uh, a particular quandary right now in the legal academy. If affirmative action is struck down in the Fisher case, professional programs like law schools will suffer even greater than, than undergraduate programs. Think about the logic of percentage programs like Texas. Not only would admitting students based solely on undergraduate class rank cause more racial exclusion in law schools and sacrifice many of the interests of so-called holistic admissions processes, but it would be virtually impossible to administer a percentage program in law school admissions. Unlike state universities, most law schools draw their populations from a national pool of applicants and a national pool of undergraduate institutions. And this is only increasing as law schools, like the University of Virginia, for example, get more autonomy from the state. Furthermore, law schools, and particularly those not bound by quotas on in-state students, want more out-of-state students so that they can charge these students higher tuition and in this time of uh, fiscal retrenchment receive more revenue. And equally important, law schools want more out-of-state students because they are seeking to improve their U.S. news rankings. They hope to attract the most statistically significant class that they can, uh, statistically selective class that they can admit. In 2003, many in the legal academy breathed a sigh of relief in Grutter v. Bollinger, the law school admissions case. But Grutter survived and survived narrowly due to a market case for diversity. In the last decade, we in the legal academy did not organize around a moral case for reparations. So today, given what we know about the relationship between legal change and social movements, will we use this moment to organize around an expansive conception of justice, or will we, by our silence, be complicit and help to reinforce what we hope to overthrow?
Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. It's really a, uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today. This has been a fantastic conference. Um, I'm going to talk about um, something that is happening here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, the enactment of the Brown versus Board of Education um, Scholarship Act. Scholarship Act. Um, it all started with one student, Barbara Rose Johns. In April of 1951, she led a well-planned and executed student strike of Moton High School. The students were, to put it frankly, fed up. Their school was built for 167 students, and it housed over twice that many. Students went to classes in the auditorium, buses, or drafty tar paper shacks that resembled chicken coops. The roof leaked, and to make matters worse, there was a state-of-the-art high school for white kids just down the road. As Ms. Johns put it, we wanted so much and had so little. We had talents and abilities here that weren't really being realized. And I thought that was a tragic shame. And that's basically what motivated me to want to see some change take place here. There wasn't any fear. I just decided, this is your moment. Seize it. And so she did. She and her classmates embarked on the only student-led direct action against segregation at the time. And this is 1951. They enlisted the help of NAACP lawyers, Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson, in treating them in a letter Quote, you know this is a serious matter because we are out of school. There are seniors to be graduated, and it can't be done by staying at home. Please, we beg you, come down at the first of the week. Intrigued, the lawyers accepted the invitation, willing to take a look, although they had already crossed Prince Edward County off their list. The students wanted to press for equality, but the lawyers convinced them otherwise. John A. Stokes was one of the striking students, and he recently came and, and spoke here at the University of Virginia. He explained uh, the rationale of the lawyers as follows. Even if they give you equality, they said, it won't be the same. They'll find a way to snatch it away. The only way to do this was through non-segregation. So they struck a deal. The students would seek non-segregation, and the lawyers would represent them. On May 23, 1951, Robinson filed a suit in, the, in a case captioned as Davis versus County School Board of Prince Edward County. That case went through the federal court pipeline to be consolidated with Brown versus Board of Education. And after the court's landmark de decision, the defendant, Prince Edward County, took a page from their student's book. It pursued a strike of its own, shutting down for five years, from 1959 to 1964, rather than comply with the court's order in Brown. The county did so as part of the Commonwealth of Virginia's massive resistance in the wake of Brown. It is a shameful yet not widely known part of our history. And in 2004, on Brown's 50th anniversary, the Commonwealth took steps to reckon with its past by enacting a reparative measure, the Brown versus Board of Education Scholarship uh, Program and Fund. This law makes scholarships available to any current Virginia resident who can show he or she was unable to attend public school during massive resistance. With these scholarships, students may pursue their high school equivalents, associates, bachelors, as well as masters and postgraduate uh, degrees, as well as other pro expenses. The program began with a, a $1 million uh, private donation. Um, the source of this idea was Ken Woodley. Uh, the editor of the Farmville Herald. Woodley explained that the newspaper, quote, was a loud voice for massive resistance. And I've always felt that we needed to be a very, very loud voice for what needed to be done today. The most recent data we could find uh, was that uh, as of 2011, about 70 people, including a handful of whites, had received these scholarships. And it's a, a remarkable step. It makes Virginia the only state to provide such relief to persons harmed by its intransigence in the face of the court's mandate. Moreover, by seeking to compensate the persons injured by the state's discriminatory actions, the General Assembly joined state legislatures in Florida, Oklahoma, and California in enacting measures designed to compensate for past state-sanctioned harms visited upon African Americans. In other words, granting reparations. 
I was interested in the Brown Fund Act for its potential to advance the discussion about reparations, to take it out of the realm of controversy. And in addition, uh, Virginia's example suggests that reparations talk could serve as a powerful justification for systemic public education reform. And so my plan for today is to examine reparations in the context of Virginia's public education system, where massive resistance was uh, natural in the state's trajectory of subordination of African Americans. The Virginia experience, specifically the case of Prince Edward County, illustrates the salience of public education in the machinery of subjugation of blacks, which in turn suggests that this baby step the Commonwealth has taken uh, with the Brown Fund Act should now be followed with massive reform. <laughs> to make this case, I'll first briefly discuss what I mean by reparations, which draws upon the extensive body of literature by critical race legal scholars. Uh, then I'll discuss some of the high or low lights of Virginia's example to finally examine how reparations talk might support systemic reform in public education. Um, critical race legal scholars such as Eric Yamamoto, Mari Matsuda, Charles Lawrence, Derek Bell have all invoked reparations talk. Through their work, which I discussed in much greater detail in my paper, we can glean the following principles uh, about what is truly reparative. Uh, first, it must be race conscious. Tra it must be transformational, that is, promote systemic change. And finally, it, it should provide an opening for addressing other forms of subordination. Um, in greater detail, race consciousness. Mari Matsuda says reparations theory provides a unique lens for focusing on the experiences of the oppressed and for recognizing the connections between victims and perpetrators. Victims are connected as members of an oppressed group who experience oppression precisely because of their membership in that group. Similarly, perpetrators constitute a group that, can, that may include some direct descendants of perpetrators, while others are merely, merely guilty by association. Specifically, whites as a group have benefited from the oppression of people of color because the existing social order reinforces and entrenches white privilege and, quote, the assumption that non-whites are different and appropriately treated as different. Transformative. Eric Yamamoto suggests that reparations should be viewed as a way to repair institutions and relationships damaged by injustices such as slavery and Jim Crow laws. Approach from this perspective, reparations address the moral, ethical, and political damage done to blacks and the need to restructure normative institutions and relationships, including, quote, the institutions and relationships that gave rise, gave rise to the underlying justice grievance. So to accomplish this goal, payments to individual claimants, as provided for by the Brown Fund Act, can play a role, but they can't be the entire focus. Rather, Yamamoto suggests that redress must, quote, encompass both acts of repairing damage to the material conditions of racial group life and acts of restoring injured human psyches, enabling those harmed to live with but not in history to foster the mending of tears in the social fabric, the repairing of breaches in the polity. And finally, reparations should contribute to an overarching anti-racism project. Again, according to Yamamoto, advocates should avoid reparations being used to assuage white American guilt at the expense of further entrenching injustice against other groups. So what does that mean for the Brown Fund Act? So to, to uh, assess that, let's talk about massive resistance in historical context. Virginia's public education system was part of the machinery of subordination against blacks. Indeed, the district court in the Davis case said that, quote, separation of white and colored children in the public schools of Virginia has for generations been a part of the mores of her people. Some examples. Um, as uh, Al, uh, Professor Brophy, I should say, suggested, Al, Al okay, <laughs> I can call you Al. Um, Virginia banned literacy among slaves following Nat Turner's attempted at rebellion. And um, your own historian, Carter G. Woodson, explained this as follows, Quick, uh, quote, rich planners not only thought it unwise to educate men thus destined to live on a plane with beasts, but considered it more profitable 
to work a slave to death during seven years and by another in his stead than to teach and humanize him with a view to increasing his efficiency. Uh, after the Civil War, Virginia established its first public schools. To gain readmission to the Union, the state promised not to amend its constitution to limit or eliminate educational opportunities for blacks. And so the state constitution of 1870 created free public education, and there was, in fact, no mention of segregation thanks to the work of black and white lawmakers working together, according to W.E.B. Du Bois. Education was likened to the overarching goal of assuring all persons meaningful participation in civic and political life. That did not last long. When conservatives regained power in 1871, they took steps to curb what they called the potential for, quote, rampant democracy. <laughs> they established a state school board with members appointed by the governor, the attorney general, and the state superintendent of schools to ensure that only whites would serve on this board. Then a new constitution was ratified in 1902 that called for segregated schools. And from the beginning, these schools were not equal. The prevailing ideology was that blacks needed only the most rudimentary education to prepare them for adulthood, more specifically to prepare them to, quote, submit to authority, to respect their superiors. Too much education was problematic. According to the then president of the University of Virginia, Quote, schools tended to make some Negroes idle and vicious and others able to compete with whites. <laughs> then we have the tax system within the state. Poll and property taxes funded the schools. Uh, most blacks could not afford to pay the poll tax, which had then the added benefit of keeping them away from the voting booth. Secondly, blacks typically own less valuable property. When the state raised taxes, it diverted the increased money to develop more white schools. As a, result, uh, as a result, black schools got fewer state dollars, and funding disparities grew over time. And so by 1922, Virginia spent $12 million to educate whites compared to $1 million to educate blacks. Inequities were rampant. Uh, not surprisingly. Across the state, blacks attended schools that lacked inside plumbing or central heating. To get to school, some black children had to travel 60 miles on two school buses. Black students seeking to take college preparatory classes such as Spanish or chemistry were out of luck. Physical education was not even offered in some schools. Black teachers were paid less than their white counterparts, despite having equal or even superior credentials and experience. And as blacks stepped forward to challenge the system, the social climate got heated. Two years before the court decided Brown, a black father was arrested for failing to com comply with the compulsory school attendance laws. His crime? seeking to enroll his daughter in the local white school because this county school board had closed the black school and reassigned students to an inferior school outside the town limits. And so the district court in Davis was quite right. School segregation was a tradition. It was a critical piece of the technology that relegated blacks to a subordinate position in the social order. The classification of black students prepared them for their classification in life. And as a result, challenging school segregation was deeply threatening to Virginia. When the court announced its ruling in Brown, uh, Senator Harry F. Byrd said it was, quote, a crisis of the first magnitude and decried the decision as, quote, the most serious blow struck against the rights of states. In response, elected officials at every level strategize about how to continue segregation. Virginia's governor entered into an agreement with other Southern, other Southern governors to defy the court's decision. Legislators from Virginia's fourth congressional district expressed their opposition in a resolution. This is the district in which Prince Edward County is located. In that county, the, the, Board, of school, excuse me, the Board of Supervisors decided not to fund public schools for the 1955-56 school year. They ultimately had, held off on this plan after getting assurances from state officials that desegregation would not be required for another year. 
And so for three years, the General Assembly worked on legislation to maintain a dual educational system, including provisions that authorized the governor to close integrated schools, for example. In 1959, the Virginia Supreme Court struck down those laws, ending the statewide effort at massive resistance. But Prince Edward County, excuse me, Prince Edward County carried the baton for the rest of the state. The Board of Supervisors refused to raise school taxes for the 1959-60 school year, which kept public schools closed in the fall of 1959. However, it formed a publicly funded private foundation to operate private schools for white children. The board passed an ordinance that provided tuition grants funded with public dollars to enable white students to attend these so-called private schools. As a result, white students were able to get schooling while the county resisted integration. It would take four years for an integrated private option to become uh, available to students. In the intervening years, black students had to leave the county to live with relatives in other places to get schooling. Some were taken in by Quaker families across the nation. S still others simply did not attend school at all, having no alternative. Schools finally reopened in 1964 uh, when the U.S. Supreme Court so ordered in Griffin versus Prince Edward County School Board. The crowning blow in this story, and as I said, doing the research, is just sort of like you going back, uh, remembering my uh, stunned uh, reaction to some of the stuff I was finding. Crowning blow, when the, when the word got out that the court was going to order reopening of the schools, white parents gathered in secret at the town armory at 2 a.m. There, the board gave out grants totaling $180,000 almost half the amount the supervisors had appropriated for the new school year to enable white parents to continue sending their children to private schools. The banks early, opened early in the morning so everybody could deposit their checks before the court issued its mm. mandate. Mm. Mm. So the particulars of Virginia's history are unique. There's no question that state limitations on public education serve the state's goals of subordinating African Americans. Uh, as I've said before, it telegraphed the message of black inferiority and provided the tools to assure the perpetuation of a social hierarchy in which blacks would perpetually be at the bottom rungs. So in light of that context, how does the Brown Fund Act fare as, quote, reparations? Uh, well, it's a step in the right direction. It acknowledges and seeks to remedy the state-created wrong of massive resistance. So in this regard, it seeks to repair a major breach in the polity. And it is focused on addressing the deprivation of education, providing beneficiaries financial assistance for educational pursuits. But it falls short for obvious reasons. First, it's race neutral, um, suggesting that the harms blacks and whites experienced at this time were equivalent. And of course, that is not the case. Consider uh, the experience of June Jeffrey, a white beneficiary of the Brown Fund Act. Uh, as reported in the Washington Post. She and her friends attended the all-white private school, but they, quote, lost access to facilities, counseling, and the trappings of a traditional high school experience. In contrast, Rita Mosley, a black recipient, had to leave her family to live with total strangers in Blacksburg, Virginia, where schools had remained open. She said, quote, a lot of us still feel, still, still feel hurt anger, and bitterness. No of remedy is available for the, the children of the so-called crippled generation either. It stands to reason that the harm transmitted to the students that were deprived of an education during massive resistance would trickle down to their children. Some of them report not even being able, able to help their kids with their homework. Uh, and not to mention myriad other advantages that flow from having parents who are educated. Um, there, in fact, is no mention of race whatsoever in this legislation, no apology, no examination of where the shutdown fits in the history and its legacy in present-day education. And so it's a good first step, but it is constrained. The Brown Fund Act, by its own terms, is not transformational. It is a move toward reconciling a troubling past, and it has opened the door to a chapter that has been silent in Virginia's history. So what can we take from Virginia's example? Uh, we can recognize the significant role public education has played in supporting a subordinating social order. And therefore, it's an excellent site, I think, for reparative measures. 
Public education in too many places retains the vestiges of overt discrimination, whether from uh, the allocation of taxes, exclusion from the political system, overt segregation, discrimination in housing, and school boundary lines that were based on residential patterns, among other things. Great disparities, I don't have to tell you, exist in public education uh, and student achievement. And segregation persists in much of the nation. And so schools provide an avenue for addressing inequalities confronting students of color without affording primacy to one form of oppression over another. Moreover, the nation has much to gain by embarking on a meaningful, substantive education reform effort. Uh, such that, as Derek Bell would insist, there is interest convergence to be had here. It is no secret that American students lag behind many of their counterparts around the world. And that has implications for our continued prosperity, among other things. And so, as I've suggested, we must reckon with our past, as painful and difficult as it is, reckon with the enormity and complexity of state-sponsored subordination, reckon with how many benefited from that system even if they fail to implement it. Reparation talk can get that discussion going, and in so doing, help us come up with strategies that will transform the nation. And so as I leave you, consider again 16-year-old Barbara Rose Johns's words, this time tweaked a little. So many have talents and abilities here that aren't being realized. It is a tragic shame. Some change must take place. This is our moment. Seize it. Thank you to um, all three of you for uh, great presentations. We have about uh, 10 minutes for uh, questions. So uh, with that, we'll open the floor. Sure, and I, I think I need to bring this to you. So I, th I thought these were terrific presentations. And uh, I, I wanted to add an addendum to your presentation, Verna. Uh, and the addendum is that um, it's, it's, it was the process of massive resistance that actually was the first point in which school vouchers and parental mm -hmm. choice mm -hmm. were introduced Charter in the United States. Uh, that's yes, right. Yes. So, so, so uh, that's kind of an interesting yes. side note. The, uh, the other footnote is uh, instrumental in the design of those mechanisms for circumventing desegregation were uh, the, um, the economics faculty at the University of Virginia, known as the Virginia School, including, in particular, James Buchanan, who received a Nobel Prize, and Gordon Tullock. So wow. I think that's, that's also interesting. And the final comment I'd like to make is uh, that Ms. Johns's move, her initial strategic move, which I, I think was ultimately undercut by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, was a move in the direction of what sometimes was derisively referred to as deluxe Jim Crow, which is, is the idea that, in fact, we'll maintain separation, but we will, in fact, introduce equality of resources, et cetera. So what she and her classmates were trying to do was to get a physical structure of their school that was parallel with the one that the white kids were attending. And, uh, and then when, when the move was made to go towards desegregation, that effort was ultimately lost. Um, and, and it's an interesting puzzle because your leverage for pursuing equality was the white fear of desegregation. And so it, there, there is a tension that's involved in that whole, that whole gambit. But I, I, I mean, uh, you, the story you tell is, is an amazing one a very disturbing one, and I think that the state of Virginia's Brown Fund is, is a very hollow uh, attempt to achieve redress for what happened there. Yeah. Well, that, I, yeah, I think you're, I mean, they, the, when the uh, students, it seemed like that was the deal that was struck in order to, for the lawyers to represent them. They had to abandon. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's a whole other conversation, right, that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the NAACP lawyers were really pushing the equal part. I mean, Thurgood Marshall himself, you know, talked about the precedent he had to work with was Plessy and that he worked the hell out of the equal part. Right. 
right? And so, you know, there's a, you know, query whether by 1951 they had gone as far as they could on the equal. I don't know. Um, but anyway, thank you. I, I had a comment in the same regard. Um, I've done a lot of work in North Carolina on the coast, and um, like one of the top ten poorest counties in the state is Terrell County, which is majority black. And, um, you know, in the late 50s, uh, the blacks were trying to get a high school. Uh, the closest hi- high school for blacks was six counties away. And so they had been trying desperately to create a high school. And um, the city kept promising, 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 but nothing would ever happen. And then eventually, um, one of the black landowners uh, donated land. Rosenwald came in, built a beautiful state-of-the-art school. But the whites said, you know, it's really too beautiful for blacks. And so they took over the school, and black people never, ever occupied it. But it was a similar kind of thing. You know, it's like n- no matter what, you know, what efforts they made, there was just no way that whites were going to allow them to have that kind of access. Thank you for that. In my paper, I talk a bit about the Rosenwald schools because the other part of my agenda was to um, reveal how much work black folks have done to try to secure equality and educational access because, you know, the rap against us is we don't value. Pardon me? Even though we're supposedly... That's right. We don't value education, but and, you know, at every turn, people the Rosenwald schools that effort so so remarkable because black folk commit they would they would donate whatever they had monetarily, um, chickens, you name it, anything to make sure that their kids had an education. We have a question back here. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. They were really great. Um, in thinking about reparations and um, the university. Uh, how do we begin to conceptualize reparative justice independent of affirmative action discourse, or do we? Um, especially when we're thinking about um, faculty and graduate student and student retention rates and, and sort of the experiential context that you're sort of laying out, um, Dr. Lovelace, in, in, in terms of BALSA, um, and even thinking about the historical trajectory of, uh, of the university's relationship to um, to enslavement and discrimination and those sorts of things. How do we, how do we conceptualize reparative justice um, today within the university? I think it's a fantastic question. Um, outside of the admissions context, um, there, are lo- there are a number of things. One, um, faculty hiring. Um, even within most law schools today, <clears throat> if there are three or four black faculty members on the faculty, then they're head and shoulders above. We know that in the, in the um, academy writ large at UVA, for example, it's 3% tenure and tenure track black faculty. Um, and so uh, reparative justice would mean addressing um, not only the faculty, but then also the pipeline. Um, graduate students, how, how are graduate students being trained? Um, we might also think about the curriculum. Um, what, the, what the students were pushing for, that if you want people who are thinking about social justice outside of the walls of a public institution, um, that public institutions need to be training public servants. And so we might recruit students. So this might be tied to an admissions policy where, you select, where you're selecting for students who are going to do public service work. Um, I think also labor practices. Uh, the labor practices on many of these college campuses, thinking about the neoliberal agenda, um, continues to undermine um, uh, labor um, and indignity. I think the last thing is housing. Um, you, if you look at the lands that are often bought up around l- lots of these college campuses, um, the ways in which some of the land, if we think about the South Lawn, how is that land gained, that there might be reparative justice there as well. There was something else. I had been reading the Brown Fund report, uh, not the Brown Fund, now I'm thinking Brown University's report. I'm going to just switch uh, gears, uh, different Brown. Um, uh, in the report, the authors say that, educate, that universities are experts at teaching and learning. So building on, on, on what Tim has said, you think to consider um, the research. I mean, as, and also as Al was suggesting, you know, we've, we, he talks about scholars at the universities that were rest- you know, doing pro-slavery sc- scholarship. That's what I should put in quotation marks, that scholarship, right? What kind of scholarship 
are our professors engaging in? Um, and is that the kind of scholarship that is going to be, that can be, or has the potential to be reparative, right? Um, the engagement of a public university or any university with its community. Um, you know, we sit, I, I'm at the University of Cincinnati. Um, we are right in the heart of, you know, the city. And we are working toward, but we could do a much better job of engaging with the community. Brown uh, University set up a fund um, to help public schools. I mean, why not in the in raising money, raise money to assist the public uh, schools in your area, um, recognizing that some of those kids could be coming to your institution, um, and then telling the truth. Um, right? I mean, the university should be the site of those truth and reconciliation committees, right? Can you imagine here at, at the University of Virginia talking about what happened in massive resistance? You know, as it is, Virginia Commonwealth University is setting up, it's got the oral history project around this. Why is it there? Why isn't it, why isn't something happening here at UVA? Um, you know, those kinds of things can, can be repaired. It seems like the university, we have so many thinkers and creative thinkers, we ought to be putting our, our brains um, to use in that regard. Uh, we have two other questions, and we're about out of time. Uh, I have uh, two parts to this now because I want to follow up to what you just said. Um, I was going to comment for one that uh, this seems like this could be part of a larger reconcilia uh, reconciliation project which is to say I was uh, thinking of, for instance, in Germany, it's known that outside the uh, large government building in Berlin, uh, the Reichstag, there's a large garden, which basically is a testimony to the victims of the Holocaust. Uh, so my thought on this is just that um, how do rep reparations is one aspect, but are there larger cultural projects? And I think that's what you're kind of uh, referencing as generally dis discussion. And my follow-up to that is, um, I was recently uh, 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 I'm listening to a David Blight piece, which uh, discussed, I think, only a couple years ago here in Virginia, uh, that there was a reference in a uh, largely used school book uh, to thousands of slaves fighting for the Confederacy. And of course, this is actually historically inaccurate, that uh, it's true that there was discussions of giving them freedom to use them as fighters, but it never actually went through. Um, so this is recent. This isn't far in the past. This is something that's still going on. So it feels like th that kind of larger cultural project is important to counter uh, this continued strength of the lost cause, which is particularly strong uh, in the South and you know, even gets to faculty positions. There are people who, who teach more or less, I think, um, the lost cause and uh, that's a story that ha I think is significant to me to be uh, countered as much as possible. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, there, the more facts that we can get out there, I mean, just you, you, you mentioned that textbook, but it, did you all see at the, can, the CPAC, that encounter where, you know, that white, uh, the, uh, one of the guys up there talking about, well, once again, it was just like the slide that uh, um, uh, was, we had yesterday, the discussion yesterday. Well, blacks ought to be happy that they were enslaved because, you know, they got food and they got shelter. I mean, there, there's a great disconnect between the reality of, of slavery. Um, it's never, it's shot, it never, and it never, stops to surprise me like when you see those who you who do you think you are shows Paula Dean shocked to find out that her ancestors own slaves you want to say really Paula <laughs> you know and, and and I mean not to mention I mean so that they can't there's just a complete inability to come to groups with that not to mention again to reference the Brown report all the ways that the economy depended upon slavery that is how we got our wealth as a nation, I mean, just you know, just focusing on that. So it, it seems like there's there's a ton. I think there are a ton of projects, um, in you know, in, in terms of you know, educating, and maybe it's you know, looking beyond the typical. I mean, we're here at a conference. You know, we're talking. We agree with each other. We and, and we you know, we like talking about this stuff. But you know, one of the things that I was really happy to find out about is there are documentary filmmakers that are doing a story. They're doing a film about the, they called, they closed our schools. And they're looking to release it um, 
in 2014 on the anniversary of, of the Griffith case. I personally think this would make a great feature film because, you know, the, the story I tell about Barbara Rose Johns, they did all these machinations to get the principal out of the building and get all the other adults away, and they gathered everybody into the auditorium, and she stood up at the podium and took her shoe and pounded on the podium to get everybody's attention. I mean, there's just, these are real, you know, compelling stories. I mean, maybe we ought to be thinking about, in addition to the research that we do, but how do we translate that into um, popular culture? I you think, know, I think that has to happen. I think one of the things in terms of just being local about our cultural imagination is um, how people are greeted on campus. So when people, when students take tours with their families, um, with the you guys, they're often talking about a slave to scholar tour, right? That there's a sort of linear trajectory, not that there are ebbs and flows of racial justice. Um, one of the other things that I, that really disturbed me is our remembering of Henry Martin at UVA. Yeah. And this is being incorporated right now, even with that, within this culture, that he transforms into the happy slave, right? He, who he, rang the bell every day. Who rang the, exactly. It's just, it, it's tragic. And so how we think about our public spaces, I think are incredibly important. And, and the stories that students tell um, are integral to that. There you have it. Uh, I was curious about the point that you just made about folding in uh, the contemporary in, into these conversations. And I'm thinking specifically about two women, uh, Tanya McDowell and Kelly Williams Bolar, who were both prosecuted for sent, defrauding school districts for sending their kids to better schools. Um, and the kind of apparatus of incarceration and imprisonment uh, that's happening in the present moment um, that's even affecting sort of this educational inequity and in, inflecting in that, right? So how do those women's experiences become part of a reparations movement which sort of looks back to a Jim Crow structuring of educational inequity when the present moment it seems to be increasingly about the sort of incarceration and imprisonment sort of structures of inequality? And can reparations speak to this kind of present mass incarceration situation even on issues of education? Well, I have to say, yes. another local yes. connection, my husband represented Kelly Williams Bolar. Oh, wow. Um, so it's funny. He'll be so, <laughs> he will be thrilled to know that somebody asked about her at this conference. Um, I, I think, you know, that is, um, I think that gets us back to what we talked about last night, getting to the question of what kind of country do we want to live in? You know, do we want to live in a, and that is something that everybody can wrap their minds around. Even people that, you know, the, the state, you know, the, the school board not surprisingly came up with all kinds of reasons. Now, I'm more familiar with the Kelly Williams Bolar case for, for obvious reasons. They came up with all kinds of reasons. Well, she lied and she, you know, she's a dishonest person and all this other kind of stuff. But at the, at the at a basic level, she's trying to provide for her kids. She's trying to make sure her kids get an education in a school that's safe. That's a dialogue that, you know, that resonates across the board. Um, so, I mean, with, at the risk of, you know, sound, you know, trying to take a race-neutral approach, uh, 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 you know, to this whole thing, I, it feels to me like we have really got to, there's, there's something big that needs to happen. And you know, Dr. Watson talked about we need a movement. We need a movement bad. Um, we need a movement really badly because there are lot, so many things that are happening uh, and the, the destruction of public education and the lack of opportunity for children across this nation is, is huge. And people are, we, we have yet to focus on, we still are in our, you know, we're the greatest country on earth, but we rank, you know, number 30 in, in, in math. And we rank, our kids are number one in their perception of themselves. <laughs> True. Yeah. The syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's not talking about in terms of reparations, but it is, it is, it can be reparative. Can I say something Martha. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say, I, I don't want to really be defensive about this, but um, I think there are there have been a number of things that have been said in the room that suggests that nothing is happening at the, at the University of Virginia on these issues. 
And I just wanted to say that there are a number of things that are happening that I think we should at least acknowledge. There has been a, a student initiative for years to try to get some kind of a representative um, uh, uh, monument or, or space to acknowledge the role of slavery at the university. Uh, my colleague Frank Dukes has initiated an organization called UCARE, University Community Action for Racial Equity, um, and it's been funded by an outside grant to do a number of things, which includes outreach to the community. Um, and uh, Frank and I, for the last three years, have been teaching a course called UVA History, Race and Repair, to, to look at some of this history and to have students do projects that, that involve things in the community. And I think uh, what, what I just want to say is that it's so hard to get any traction around these issues, in part because all these things are sort of grassroots based. They're not coming from the top down. And so uh, Brown University, which, had, uh, which was an initiative that came from its president, is a very, very different kind of initiative. And um, you know, I think the, the goal for the future is to get buy-in from the top of the university down, but it's incredibly hard to do that. So I think lots of people just don't know that there are things that we're trying to get started here to acknowledge that. So. Well, I really, really just enjoyed the papers and learned a lot. But um, to this question of, what needs to be done. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that we really need major transformation of public education in this country, or we're really facing a dire crisis. And one thing that was heartening to me, or is heart, you know, as a Chicagoan that's been ongoing, is the Chicago Teachers Union, which many of you might know, like waged a big strike last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've been really trying to go beyond bread and butter issues and raise a kind of philosophical, kind of moral critique of race to the bottom, school reform, charter schools, and all of that. I mean, there was just in the news yesterday that uh, you know, all these scores of schools are being closed on the south and west sides, and they're going to be leading protests against that. But they've really been calling for ambitious and bold proposals on school spending, on wraparound services you know, for, for kids. They've been comparing what the day is like for Chicago public school students with what the day is like for students at the private lab school where Rahm Emanuel sends his kids, where President Obama used to send his kids. And so they're really also, I think that's been a taboo question. We can't talk about private education as if that's a somehow different universe. And they've been really challenging that divide and saying, no, we can't. Let's look at where the, you know, the children of the Democratic Party <laughs> in Chicago sends their kids to school. And so they've been really trying to, I think, boldly and frontally take on a lot of these questions. I mean, what's going to, you know, what the fate of all of that is, is really um, up in the air. But I think it's heartening to see that they've, and they've won lots of parent support, lots of community support. So it's not just, you know, you know, teachers are obviously really a target, and they've been really a scapegoat. And I think, you know, we need to build these relationships between teachers and community members to sort of roll back some of this. Wow.